This is the Magic Word Podcast.com. Hello, this is Scott Wells for the Magic Word Podcast.com. And today uh, we're going to. I'm going to say revisit. We really haven't had, uh, but only one ventriloquist on here many years ago. And uh, that was a gentleman, uh, Michael Roberts, I believe was his name. Um, Is that right? Robinson, Mike, 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 Michael Robinson, and uh, he was out of Nova Scotia and in Sogali. It's been nearly a decade, seems like, since I've had him on there. And there are so few ventriloquists, I believe, in our art, and that is another part of the variety arts of magic. That is juggling and ventriloquists. Whenever, as you know, they're seen at a magic convention, they are remembered and all, uh, far outweighing all the rest of the magicians because they are the novelty act of, of that. And I understand also, like at uh, juggling conventions, everything when the magician performs, they are remember because they're the novelty act at a juggling convention and perhaps likewise at the ventriloquist convention. I'm getting off the subject. Well, actually, the subject is all about uh, throwing your voice, if you will. And this is a very good friend of mine. I Gosh, I can't remember how far back that we go, uh, but uh, we have worked together. I've, I've booked him for other shows, for other corporate clients, and someone uh, I love, and he is universally loved, and also on the cruise ships where he's worked, as well as the corporate market. Uh, someone that uh, is down in Atlanta, Georgia, and he's kind of in between some things right now, so we happen to catch him. So please welcome my friend, Mr. Mark Merchant. Hey there, Mark. How are you doing, my friend? Hey, Scott Wells, thank you for that great introduction. Uh, thank you for the invitation to be on your show. I have been briefly on your podcast in 2015 when you were we were at the TAOM yep. in Austin. I was on the show the first night, the one that Robert Baxter emceed. Well, that was one you, where Trixie Bond was president, right? Correct. And, yeah. and I was in part of a podcast with the late, great Walter Zaney Blaney. Yes. Yeah. You, had a, you had a backdrop, the Magic Podcast, and... I forgot what I said, but I'm honored to be back. And I appreciate the things you said universally love because the last week of, of, of 2022, someone who I won't name uh, sent me a Facebook message and said, nobody likes you. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, nobody well, likes me. Everybody hates me. I guess I'll go I eat know. some worms. <laughs> yes. Yes. That's exactly what I sent back. Did you really? <laughs> yeah. I'm not going to mention her name, Jill Kimmel. She's Jimmy Kimmel's sister, but that's okay. So <laughs> I don't care. Life will go on. It does. You know, when I say you don't really so love there are, I don't care who you are. I don't think the Pope is universally loved. I mean, by most people, but I'm saying there has to be one or two someplace in the world who don't like the Pope. There's got to be somebody who, or whoever it is, a musical a musician who is popular or whatever, but there's always going to be someone who you're, you're goring someone's bowl, I guess, basically. There's always going to be something or someone who is going to be upset by something that you do or say or, or whatever. Uh, so, yeah, we're not going to be always universally loved. We're not God, you know, so... No, you're you're goring someone's bull. I saw a ventriloquist at the ventriloquist convention about four years ago. It was pre uh, all of the pandemic or pandemic, and he was an open mic, and he had a a clown character, a clown vent figure, and the clown said to him, "Have you ever been gored?" And the ventriloquist said, "Gored." He said, "Yeah, gored." He said. What do you mean, Gord? He goes, well, you're a ventriloquist. You can't make me say bored, so Gord. <laughs> <laughs> Don't be goring, Mark. <laughs> Don't be goring. That's funny. <laughs> well, speaking, you mentioned about ventriloquist conventions, and I said something to begin with about how that we as a magician would be the novelty act. Is that true, uh, pretty much? I mean, ab you have absolutely. I've seen, I've seen magicians at uh, ventriloquist conventions, and, and they rock it. I've seen my friend David Ginn. I saw Walter Blaney, God rest his soul, mm -hmm. at a at event convention. I, I can't remember the names of some other magicians that I've seen there, but they, they usually were like an MC. which when I've performed at magicians' conventions, I've often been the MC because I'm not doing magic in between the uh, the magic acts. So. Right, right. Well, when I did see you at that uh, convention back in Austin several years ago, I do recall uh, speaking with you, and that's what I do whenever we have conventions. I do daily reports from the conventions with just kind of a variety of people uh, throughout the convention who are registrants or talent and organizers, the dealers and whatnot which is why that I had a chance to chat with you. And uh, I, I didn't at the time get a chance to uh, sit down with you. Seems like that you were in and out. I don't recall that you stayed for the whole convention. Maybe that's why we I, didn't get a sit down. 
because you were I, off to I, another cruise. <laughs> you're exactly right. Trixie was nice enough to engage me to do the event the first night. And then literally a week before Crystal Cruise Lines called me and said, Mark, somebody fell out. We need you to fly to Iceland to get on a show. So mm -hmm. I, I called Trixie and I said, Trixie, you don't have to pay me. I said, just, just my airfare just to get from Atlanta to Austin round trip mm -hmm. and the hotel for one night because I want to do the show, but I couldn't do the other things. And she said, deal. So yeah, I came I, in and did the show. I know that you and her have been friends for a long time and had gone to school together. And as I understand, I just found out recently that you're the godfather to her son. Yes. We, she and I didn't go to school together, but oh, I, school? Met, I met her at the IBM International Convention in New Orleans. Oh, okay. In summer of 1971. I was a junior in high school. I think uh, Trixie was also a junior in Houston. I was a junior in Atlanta, Georgia. Okay. And, and she's just a, still a beautiful girl, beautiful lady. And she invited me. She said, why don't you come to the TAOM in Texas, which was in Texas in 1971. It was mm -hmm. as it always is around yeah. Labor Day. Right, right. I was my senior year in high school and my parents, both of them, Peggy and Sherwood, were nice enough. They said, if you want to go to the convention, we'll let you out of school one day. So, because it always started, I believe, on a Friday, right? Yes, it starts yeah, Friday, correct. Goes Friday through I, Monday, because Labor I Day came, weekend. I came in <clears throat> Thursday night. I didn't miss school Thursday. I was, I was in the show. I was, I was at the convention Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. I guess I went home Labor Day, and it was a great, great TAOM. Uh, mm -hmm. Mark Wilson was there. Uh, Bev Bergeron. Uh, I had some great talent, John Shirley, Walter mm -hmm. Blaney. It was just, and I remember, uh, I remember Jay Marshall was there and I happened to be sitting in the audience next to Jay Marshall watching a show. And Mark Wilson came in and sat next to Jay Marshall. And I'm, I'm sitting there, I was 16 years old, Scott. And I'm like, <laughs> I'm, I'm next to literal living legends, Mark yeah. Wilson. I wouldn't be a performer today had I not watched the magic land of Alakazam. And of course, Jay Marshall was on the Ed Sullivan show, probably magic royalty, right. right? Doing lefty and doing everything else. And, uh, I was sitting there and I was next to Jay Marshall and Trixie Dodson at the time, Charlie mm -hmm. Dodson's daughter was on the first night doing, I think it was Trixie and the magic. What was, what was her? It was like sort of a, an Alice in Wonderland kind of theme her mm -hmm. show was. And she did, a dove production where the dove clearly came. It, it's all right to talk about magic stuff on sure, this. Yes, uh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not, I'm not giving any, but no, 99% of the, the people dove, are magicians who listened. <laughs> okay. The dove was obviously stolen from, uh, between her bosom. Okay. And, uh, and, and Mark Wilson leaned to Jay Marshall and said, that's one of those living bras that you've heard so much about. <laughs> That's a true story. And, and I was like, I was like, man, I am, I am, this is so cool that I am here in this great stuff. And yeah. So yeah, that was, it was a great convention. And also, of course I was kind of smitten with Trixie and, uh, and, and she let me know, she said, Oh, by the way, I've got a boyfriend. Her boyfriend at the time was Mark Masterson, another MM. And I said, Trixie, you need to go with me. I've got the same initials. It'll, <laughs> but it never, it never happened. But she and I, She's one of my best friends in magic, and I am proud to be her son, Alex's. I've been, I was there at the christening, and I'm, mm -hmm. I'm godfather. Yeah, that is very cool. Now, were you doing ventriloquism at the time when you were in high school, back then even? I was doing, I was doing magic and ventriloquism, like a lot of people in the art form that we share. Yeah. The first live performer that I saw doing the conjuring and, and the vent thing, he did them both. And I saw him at a Cub Scout blue and gold banquet. His mm -hmm. name was Clem Fortner. He was an Atlanta police officer. He did a great magic act and he did a vent act too. And I love the magic, but the vent, when he brought his character out and the puppet said, I want to sing a song. And Clem said, okay, sing. And the puppet said, I'm going to sing a song for Mark Merchant. And everybody started laughing like they were laughing at me. Yeah. I was, I was, I thought, this is so cool. Why did he choose to sing a song for Mark Merchant? Because my dad was the assistant scoutmaster uh -huh. and had hired Clem Fortner. And he said, you know, say something about my son. And Clem mm -hmm. Fortner, and when I got really into magic, 
when I joined the IBM when I was 14, Clem Fortner was in the local ring and he and David Ginn were absolute, they were my mentors. I wouldn't be a performer today had it not been for Clem Fortner. Wow. And, and, well, and David Ginn. That does go way back. Uh, certainly when I remember as a child reading comic books, and I'm sure many will recall this as well, is you can throw your voice and you can have, a, there's a cartoon of somebody and a voice coming out of a box or out of another room behind a door. And I thought that was great. And I remember ordering that book and it basically, I don't remember what it said, but there was no way I could do what they were trying to teach me. And I, I quickly realized either I'm not going to be able to master this or I'm, you know, I didn't have any, any mentor. I lived in a small farming community in central Illinois, Southern Illinois. So I really didn't, have access to any teacher who could show me how to do this. And so uh, I just kind of gave that up, but that's always been something that's uh, fascinated me. I mean, you must have had somebody, I mean, we're, you're near my age. You're not as old as me, but you do have. I think, some... I, I think I'm, I think I'm older than you, Scott. You think? I'm 68. No, no you're younger than me. Well, wow. <laughs> you're the one person in the performing arts that's younger than me. Holy cow. I just got <laughs> off a cruise ship and, you know, when they did a, a reading of the old man in the sea, they asked me to play the old man. <laughs> I just made that up. Thank well, you. <laughs> you have to write that down. Uh, yeah. <laughs> when, uh, well, that's why I've let my hair grow white instead of continuing to color that. But uh, no, you are uh, younger than me by a few years. But anyhow, I, the, the point is, did you have someone then who mentored you or did you kind of go through that in order to book on ventriloquism as well? I'm always curious. I mean, I don't get to talk to Vince very often. Often. I learned ventriloquism from a record album, oh. 33 and a third RPM record by yep. the great ventriloquist, Jimmy Nelson. I know you remember Jimmy sure. Nelson. Yeah. He, and he, he the first, <laughs> Nestle. Nestle makes the very best all together. Chocolate. He had a record, <laughs> instant ventriloquism, which I got as a Christmas present when I was 10 years old. It, it, it was uh, it had real instructions and it had a booklet, of course, too, about and one the instant ventriloquism was it had the the characters lines recorded and there was enough space in the groove of the record. So you would say, hi, I'm Mark Merchant. And then you would just the puppet would just go and hi, I'm Danny O'Day. And, mm -hmm. and that was the instant part. Hide the record player behind a chair and do a show. That's oh, how I, I still do it. That's how I still do it today. <laughs> so I had the instructions about how to be a ventriloquist. And true story, Scott, I got that. I'd already, when I was eight years old, I got yeah. the Adam's Magic set, uh -huh. which had, which had like the, uh, the ball and vase and, uh, and the imp bottle and, mm -hmm. and some of the biggies. When I was nine, I got the magic kit from FAO Schwartz, mm -hmm. which had a few more sophisticated tricks, but, I was always interested in the vent thing. And so when I was 10, I got the ventriloquist record, but Santa Claus did not give me a puppet, a figure or anything. Hmm. And my mom and dad, who seemed to be the direct conduit to Santa, they told me that Santa said I would get a ventriloquist dummy one day if I really showed that I wanted to stick with ventriloquism, that it wasn't hmm. like my car lessons or piano lessons that I didn't want to practice. But I started practicing the ventriloquism and I do, did a couple of shows. I kid you not. And I coerced my brother and sister to be my puppets with with my mother's eyeliner pencil. I drew like the, the marionette. So there. Yeah. And I got them to do uh, by squeezing their necks. Be, right. Right. They uh -huh. can't be here in the podcast because they're in the shop being repaired. <laughs> <laughs> but when I was 12 years old, I got my first ventriloquist puppet character figure. so you never use sock puppets or anything then in between i had i had a sherry lewis lamb yeah. chop yeah puppet but i never did a show with and i had a couple of hand puppets that that didn't move their mouth they just moved yeah. their head mm -hmm. i never liked that type of puppetry because it was like you were holding the puppet and and he or she appeared to just have some kind of nervous tick every time <laughs> they talked it'd be like well so what do you think joey i don't know what do you think yeah. So, so yeah. I got a ventriloquist and the first ventriloquist puppet I got was a Danny O'Day puppet from the Sears and Roebuck catalog. And it all, it just had a string on the back of the neck that you pulled. And the mm -hmm. only animation was the mouth, the mouth. And mm -hmm. next year I got a better one also from the toy company, FAO Schwartz, which had the hollow body 
and the head on a stick. It's it reach your head in the or hand in the back of the jacket. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It had one animation. It was just the mouth move. And it was it was it was not it didn't look like Danny O'Day and it didn't look like Jerry Mahoney. It was mm -hmm. kind of a it was kind of a hybrid that because uh Jerry Mahoney, Paul Winchell quit licensing the rights to FAO Schwartz for them to produce the puppet. So I think they had already produced a bunch and they had to just make him up. Let me ask you a question. As I'm not a psychologist, but I play one on TV. If have you ever <laughs> thought about or had a psychologist ask you something about that? Because you see these ventriloquists in movies, they're always the crazy guys, you know, or something, or that's a, <laughs> a natural thing where the, the vent figure comes to life or whatever kind of a thing. But I would think that a psychologist would be interested in studying that, saying, are you projecting your 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 psyche into something else i mean i had a psychologist talk to me once about uh, magic you know why am i a magician are you trying to fool people or mislead people or what is it about that that's in your in your dna or in your in your mind that's trying to make you fool people and i wonder if you have thought about that or had someone ever ask you about the psychology of why you do what you do i i've when i saw a psychologist which uh, was years ago and he finally gave up and put in a salad bar which is a woody <laughs> allen line <laughs> yes yeah. uh i he did ask about exactly what you ask about and when the first time i did a show where i did ventriloquism i had done a magic show at a pta talent contest well just a show when i was like in the third grade but then the fifth grade mm -hmm. in mr caldwell's class at metaview elementary school my mother, God bless her, brought my magic kit, which by that time I had ordered magic from Top Hat Magic Company. Mm -hmm. And so I had the milk pitcher and I had the uh, the little uh, miracle ball. Which was that was Top Hat from Tulsa, Oklahoma? Uh, Top Hat from Evanston, Illinois. Oh, Evanston, okay. Used, used to advertise in the back of Boys Life magazine. Mm -hmm. okay. had, a, had an ad that was maybe not even a quarter page. It was like, be a magician, giant catalog, 10 cents. Yeah. And you sent 10 cents and you got the top hat magic catalog. And, and, and if you're like you or me, you salivated over that stuff, sure. that, and <laughs> that and the lingerie section of the Sears catalog. <laughs> what can I afford? I, mean, I really want this and I want to save up for that or sure. Exactly. Right. But yeah. I, when I did, when I did my magic slash ventriloquist act, when I did the ventriloquism, with the routine right out of the Danny O'Day manual, right out of the thing, mm -hmm. Mr. Caldwell said, he always called kids by their last name. He said, merchant, that's the best part of your show. And the mm -hmm. fact that I made him laugh, who was a teacher that, that I still respect, he was sure. a great teacher, and that I made my classmates laugh because I was not an athlete. I was not, I was a little shy. So the psychologist said, you were obviously using the puppet, the ventriloquism to say things that you were afraid to say. Like when the puppet said to Mr. Caldwell, I like that bald headed man. And I said, Danny, you shouldn't call him bald. I'm sorry, sir. You're not bald. You're just too tall for your hair. A joke that's 6,000 years old uh -huh. and still works. And Mr. Caldwell laughed and that little light bulb went off, Scott. I was mm -hmm. like, wait, I'm because it, it wasn't said with malice. It was just a joke. Right. But he laughed at it. Mm -hmm. So, so yes, I have been asked about that. And uh, my, my sweet wife and I, sometimes we've been married 34 years. And once in a while, when we have a discussion, mm -hmm. which is my euphemism for <laughs> an argument, uh, so, something that I've done wrong. <laughs> <Yeah. it's> always, <laughs> I, I, I have, I have a few times brought out a puppet and said, let's, let's get through this. And, mm -hmm. and generally it'll make her laugh. If she's really upset about something, it'll make her even more mad. Well, I've, I've heard sometimes a psychologist, I've seen this on television, where a psycholo child psychologist will bring out a puppet because a child would more easily talk with a puppet than they do to a human being. And so when you're talking with kids, do you sometimes see the kids actually, I assume you do, interacting with the, with the figure rather than you? Oh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yes, yes. I, I, my, my two nephews... Uh, one is three and one is two and they they like a little bit of magic that i do but but when i bring out the puppet they will talk to the puppet but they don't want to get too close to the puppet uh -huh. because it's it's not quite they're like wait a minute 
I'm not sure he's really real, you know, but right. like a voice is coming out of him or it appears that a voice is coming out of it. Right, right. Could be a little bit scary. Well, kind of got off on a couple of tangents over there. Going back to conventions, did you, then you went to TAOM, you were impressed by that. And then later, did you start to get books like during college going to some conventions? I mean, like in Atlanta, I assume that you went to the... Uh, um, oh, what was the one that the fall, uh, the harvest of magic uh, back then that the manies used to put on and that kind of a thing. I, I used to go to that. And I, I mean, as I, David Ginn, when, when I met him after, when I graduated from the eighth grade, he was doing a show at a library in Decatur, Georgia. And mm -hmm. he used to be on a television show in Atlanta, uh, a performer named Buddy Farnan. Oh, who, I remember Buddy. He, yeah. I'm not oh, a yeah. Buffalo. Yeah. What a great yeah. guy. Yeah, he was he was he was he was sort of mentored by Gene Gordon hmm. and, and Buddy Farnan had a television show in Atlanta called the Fun Town Show, which ironically, Buddy Farnan was also the manager of a big amusement park in Atlanta pre Six Flags called Fun Town. And hmm. he did magic and ventriloquism and he would often have young magicians on and David Ginn was on there like once a month, yeah. sometimes a dove act, sometimes always doing something silent. And so he was doing a show at the Maud Burris Library in Decatur, Georgia. And my dad took me to the show. And afterwards, I went up and talked to him and told him that I was, you know, into magic. And uh, he obviously liked me and, and saw something. And he persuaded my dad. He said, I think Mark has some talent. He should go to the IBM convention this summer. So the IBM in 1968 was in Chattanooga, Tennessee. Mm -hmm. which is only 90 miles from Atlanta and is an international convention, had some great performers. And of course, Carol Fox, Duke Stern, you know, Chen Kai, hmm. just on and on. And when I went to the convention the next summer, the summer of 1969, it was in Cincinnati, Ohio. And I actually polished this because in 1969, yours truly won. It's right here. IBM convention, 1969, Cincinnati, best act by a junior magician. A oh, beautiful trophy. Thank yeah. you. I think the IBM trophy still kind of look like this, don't they? Or you haven't got one. Don't know. <laughs> but, but I mean, and, I've been, and, I'm a judge. Was, so of, I have, of course, of course, there was an article in the linking ring about it. And Dan Stapleton, my magician friend in Florida, hmm. he, he sent me a copy of it. He said, what is this, Mark? It says you won the best act by a juvenile. No, it's not juvenile. It's junior magician because I was, I was under 16. Uh -huh. Over 16, you were maybe a youth magician. And then after 21, senior, you, you were a magician. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Gotcha. Um, interesting. Well, well, I want to talk a little bit about also uh, scripting uh, when it comes to, uh, you, you said, well, I go about one of the lines, that, uh, well, that's a very old line, it's centuries old or whatever. And there are a lot of old standard lines. Of course, there were events back in the vaudeville days and prior to that then as well. I mean, we won't go into the history of, of ventriloquism. I think people can go somewhere else and, or we could have a whole other podcast just on that sometime. But I um, am curious about obviously trying to keep up to date with new material, but yet still call on some of the old ones. I mean, magicians use some hack lines, if you will, which are very old and things that are, I guess, tried and true from the standpoint that some audience members have not heard that. It's like, you know, let me see your hand. No, your clean hand. Oh, that was your clean hand kind of a thing. Well, that's uh, very old, but still in still some works. audiences, never heard it. And it's so it's, it's a classic for a reason, I guess, you know, my question has to do with, do you mix a lot of the classics, if you will, some of the older vaudevillian types of humor with uh, new things? Or do you try to to script and customize to your groups? Uh, a little of both. Like when I'm working on a cruise ship, I do put in some topical material and of course some, some, some gags about where we are, where the ship is going, mm -hmm. gags about it. if something has happened on the ship that you have to address, I'll do that. But then I have the evergreens that always work. Mm -hmm. there, there's some lines that are, that I've got an outline and I fill in the gaps with with topical what's going on kind of material. Mm -hmm. So it's a it's a common. And if I do a corporate date, like the last corporate date I did in Houston was for a Houston lighting design company, and mm -hmm. I I got information about the people who booked me about like if I when I do a corporate date, Scott, if I can do like six gags 
about some of the big shots there, mm -hmm. something that, that that endears you to the audience. And there again, I would suspect that those are tried and true lines that you have already used in other corporate events or somewhere along the line. You just plug in this guy or gal's name. Some, 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 yes, are tried and true. And some are when something happens that uh, is, oh, yeah. is absolutely unique about somebody. Like mm -hmm. I, I did a show at a big community country club in Sea Island, Georgia, very affluent area. And, and there was a guy who was fishing on some waterway in Sea Island. It's a true story. And in his boat, a, an alligator came up and, and was trying to attack him. Holy cow. And he, seriously, there's no joke here. And he kicked at the alligator and the alligator, I don't think you should kick an alligator, but the alligator <laughs> grabbed his foot. But fortunately for him, all it did was, was, was managed to extract the guy's shoe mm -hmm. off. And so I have a puppet that you've seen. He's an Asian guy and his name is wingtip shoe. Mm -hmm. And sometimes he comes on stage just wearing one shoe. And at that company at corporate event in sea Island, Georgia, when I brought wingtip shoe out, I said, what happened to your shoe? He said, Oh, I gave it to Mr. So-and-so cause the alligator ate his, you know, That's and a that, great great line <laughs> it was it was it's, it's a one time only and and in the lobby of that place they had that guy's shoe that the alligator had because they they did they did euthanize kill the alligator because once he's gone rogue and started potentially attacking people it's not yeah. a good thing but they had the guy's shoe in a display all bronze and there was i mean man like, wow <laughs> yeah you can't make that, that stuff i had to say what a story. Well, yeah. along that line, by the way, uh, in, in using um, your vent figures, I assume that you write material, obviously, for that, whether I'm thinking like Jeff Dunham, where he's got like a guy who is uh, a terrorist or someone who is uh, an alien or an old man, you know, whatever, fuddy-duddy or something. And they have to be lines in character with the, the figure you have. And so when you when you go about that, do you look at a figure and say, oh, I've got some great lines for that, or I've got a line, I think I can build an act around that particular figure? I mean, how did you fall in love with your figures? Mostly, uh, one, one at a time, I would, you know, my, like every ventriloquist that started out, I had the, the cheeky boy figure. And mm -hmm. then mm -hmm. once I started working professionally, even when I was in college, I I had a gorilla puppet developed by a, an artist named Steve Whitmire, who went on to work for the Muppets. In fact, after Jim Henson passed away, Steve Whitmire was the voice and operator of Kermit the Frog. Hmm. And I had this big gorilla. I mean, a really great looking anatomical gorilla. And I was I was doing routines with him. And I did I did kind of build a whole a whole act around him. Mm -hmm. I, 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 I quit using him because his voice was like that. It was like, hello. I'm, and yeah. that if I was going to have voice problems, it was mm -hmm. a, it was a, it was a result of doing that kind of, that kind of Louis Armstrong kind of voice. It just didn't, I couldn't sustain it for too long. I would always get throat problems. Right. And you really couldn't change it at that point. I guess you kind of already had that in your mind as far as that voice for that figure. Right. Right. I mean, yeah. I, I, I have another, gorilla puppet now but he's a kinder and gentler looking yeah looking yeah and he has, he has kind of a dumb voice yeah that's kind of that's that's funny um and so with i, I want to move into a little bit of political correctness i guess of where we are <laughs> then now <laughs> Uh, because I, in speaking of an asian uh vent figure uh and i think you've got uh no, you, you have a minister figure. I mean, like a, a Joel Osteen kind of a figure. I, I do. Think. I do have. I do have a Joel Osteen. Well, I call him Reverend Wonderful out of out of yeah. out of fear of getting sued by Joel Osteen. <laughs> well, I'm sorry. <laughs> Maybe mention a name uh, there, but uh, and also you have a black character, I believe, then as well. I do. I do. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so in those cases, then do you or I know you do. You have uh, you you feign an accent, I guess, that's kind of like. Um, someone who would be in character of, uh, of that. Um, and have you, um, 
gotten a lot of uh, blowback or I'd like to hear just kind of a story. Uh, well, there you go. There's uh, the. Uh, <laughs> this is Alonzo, Alonzo Jackson. The man of hey. color. Alonzo. Yes. Hi there, Alonzo. Hey, uh, yeah, I know this guy. I know him. I know him in, in, in Houston and in Austin. Yeah, this is Scott Wells. Oh, yeah. Man, he's yeah. big time. Man, how'd you, who'd you have to tear off to get on this show, man? I don't, wow. Alonzo, you ought to think about growing a beard like this. You think you'd, I think you'd look good in a beard, man. Uh, yeah. Uh, let's, let, let, we'll, we'll, we'll give that some thought, Scott. Yeah. <laughs> so this is how, this is how Alonzo talks. Mm -hmm. and yeah. I'm not trying to do any Ebonics thing. I'm certainly not trying to make fun of the way African Americans talk. And right. When I do get blowback, I will tell you this, 99.9% .9 of the time, it's weirdly, it's from white people mm -hmm. yeah, who, who seem to be taking on the burdens of the world and say, that's, that's offensive to black people. Uh -huh. Right. And I worked at a comedy club Wednesday night in Columbus, Georgia. Yeah. Yeah. And it's mainly a, a, a comedy club. That, that mainly African-Americans go to. The other comics, except for one guy and me, were all uh, African-American, and the other guy and I were white. Yeah, and th the black people, they seem to love this character. I mean, that doesn't mean everybody does, but I'm certainly not coming out and doing jokes with him that I think denigrate. What? <laughs> denigrate. You know, that's really too close. Okay, sorry, yeah. But... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. I, well, that goes back. I, I was just thinking for an example in along that very same line about Jeff Hobson, who does a lot of gay jokes uh, about homosexuals. And he got started off in this a very long time ago. And if you haven't heard his story, if he's talked about this at magic conventions and lectures and things in the past about how he kind of came to that. And he kind of has gotten to a point where he can certainly do that, gets away with it. And what's interesting, I think, in some of the conversations I've had with him, uh, the people who are most upset are the heterosexuals who who feel like they're protecting the the, the gay uh, people, whereas the gay people are saying, this is fantastic. It's one of the most, the most funniest things. They're loving it. But the other people are just a little bit of, uh, I don't know if they're so offended by it, but it's kind of like, is, I don't know if that's politically correct or not, you know? And so it sounds like what you're telling me is similar kind of a thing. And I'm also wondering if, let's say, I would walk out as myself. And if I were starting to say the exact same lines that Jeff would, I don't think that I could get by with that today. Uh, but he can because he has embodied the character and that is him as far as how he has developed that character and people know and respect him for what he does, I guess. So he has continued to to use that. I've heard him say recently what he's had, like, I think 40,000 shows or something, you know, performances over the lifetime. So anyhow, he's been doing that. I'm, I'm kind of getting off on a tangent over here, but uh, I, I see exactly what you're saying, where there are a lot of black people who would uh, say, I think that he's funny, but they're the whites who might be in the audience are saying, yeah, I feel kind of funny because there's a black guy sitting next to me and uh, I wonder how he's feeling, you know? Well, that you, you've hit the nail on the head because it's often people look at the audience, the demographic of the audience. And when I bring out this puppet, I can see, white people look around at the black people in the audience and go, okay, is this okay? Can I laugh at this? Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. Get an affirmation and, from them. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Je Jeff Dunham uh, earlier mentioned, I mean, a superstar and a, and a great friend of mine. He said in an interview in the wall street journal that he doesn't understand how, when he brings out Ahmed or any yeah. of his other characters, that it's, it's not uh, Arab people. It's not Muslims who get offended it's always uptight white people who mm -hmm. say you, you shouldn't have that character. But, you know, I mean, he, he, he performed in, not in Saudi Arabia, but in uh, Dubai? I think, Dubai, correct. Mm -hmm. And there were a lot of very wealthy Arabs, Muslim people on the front row. And Ahmed the terrorist said something about, so I blew myself up so I can get 72 virgins in heaven. Look at these guys on the front row. They're married to six women apiece. They're driving uh, Ferraris. I didn't know that was an option. <laughs> and, and a great laugh. And he's a, he's a Texan, as you know. Yes. Jeff Dunn. I think he's in the Dallas area. But now, so we got a great laugh from all the sheiks and everybody who were in the in attendance. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah.
Very interesting. The only place the only place Dunham was not allowed on a on a world tour to use Ahmed was in Malaysia. Malaysia has a a very a big big Muslim community, and mm -hmm. so he. I, I love this. He still used Ahmed, but he brought him out with a beret on his head, mm. and he said, "This is not Ahmed. This is his cousin from France. He is Jacques Murd." <laughs> <laughs> But then did he use some of the same jokes as far as uh, him? Being... I, I think I think he did more jokes about the whole Paris thing. You know, oh, I see. Yeah. I think I see. That's... I don't think he did silence. I kill you. Yeah, I can. Exactly. <laughs> that thing. Uh, hello. Hello. Yeah. You, boy. yeah. OK, this is my voice. Yes. Yeah. Uh, we're in living color. Yeah. How are you? <laughs> and this this high definition camera. Yeah. It makes you look really old. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> you still don't look as old as me, man, I tell you. So uh, what about the working cruise ships? I would think that, and I know for a fact, and I've worked crystal seas as well, when you have to be very conscientious about every single person, because if you have 300 people or 298 that'll like you, and you get one or two who say, yeah, no, I was a little bit offended by that. You've got to have some stories about that. Oh, absolutely. I, I'm, I'm always amazed, Scott, that uh, a cruise ship I just got off Monday. There were 3,500 guests, and it was a it was a holiday cruise, Christmas cruise. Mm -hmm. I got on the day after Christmas. I got off the day after New Year, so I wasn't there for Christmas. I was home with my family for Christmas, but I was there for New Year's, and it was like this cruise, Scott, was a gift from God mm -hmm. because the shows my my two shows just rocked. Great audience, good laughs, a lot of families. And so many people, it's, I'm not an entertainer who hides after a show. I've mm -hmm. been on cruises with other acts, comedians, other variety acts, even magicians who they do their show and they don't want to, I'm a people person. I like to talk to people. I'm with you. When I'm on a cruise on the same way, I want to schmooze. I want to talk to people. Yeah. It's not that I'm looking for feedback or acclamation or whatever. I'm just a people person. I like talking to people and, and finding out what have you done when you've gone ashore or whatever. You know, I, yeah. I want to sit at the table yeah. and kind of talk with them or whatever. Right. And when, when I, you know, like a day after my show, I'm going up to the coffee place and, and I get people, they'll look and I'll see them. And then, and then some people will come up and say, are you the ventriloquist guy? And I always <laughs> say, as long as you liked me, oh That's yeah, good. you were great. And they, they want to talk to me. Sometimes they'll buy you a drink, sometimes yeah. invite you to dinner. And, and I don't mind that. And I mean, full disclosure, I have had people come up to me and say, you're the ventriloquist, aren't you? And I say, yes, as, as long as you like me. And then they go, well, can I tell you something? And I say, as long as it's nice. And they go, yeah, I, want, I say, as long as it's nice. And I have had people say, I, I didn't like you. I thought that some of your stuff was racist. And, and, and the fact that you make fun of this and that. And, and I say, look, I'm, uh, I'm sorry you didn't like that. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, it's not a buffet. You know, yeah. I try to offer something that everybody's going to like. And I, I hope that there was something in it that, that well, it was. And, and I've had some people say, well, it was until you did this joke. And then I left. And I'm like thinking, wait a minute, that joke was so offensive that you left the show. And that was about 20 minutes into my show. My show was only 45 minutes long. Mm -hmm. You know, there might have been 20 more minutes of stuff after that that really made you laugh. Well, I think sometimes people are just looking for something. They're just sitting back thinking, okay, and when, when particularly a, a if, if, there, if a person is known for that, a particular comedian is known for something, they're waiting for a joke to land. It's like, oh, that's the one, you know, that they're, they're, I guess their senses are heightened and they're waiting for and listening for any and everything that might offend them. Yes, I, I, I think so. I think so. And that's, but on this, on this particular cruise, I, I kept telling my wife, I kept saying, Cindy, this is, I'm missing you on this cruise. And she could have gone with me, but I would have had to pay her airfare mm -hmm. to St. Martin, which would have pretty much negated my entire salary <laughs> for the gig. <clears throat> so I said, the, the people have liked it. I've, I've really been blessed. Thank you, God. And then I got an email from the cruise line to my, well, it came to my agent saying two, two people actually commented that they didn't like some of my stuff and said, Mark needs to be aware of this. And I'm like thinking, okay, there were 3,500 guests on that ship. Not all 3,500 saw my show, mm -hmm. but at least 2,000 people saw my show. Mm -hmm. So two people out of 2,000 decided to write on the comment, we didn't like 
this joke that Mark Merchant did. Yeah. I mean, I guess they've got to bring it to my attention, but I'm like, huh, what? Is that something new, though, to you, Mark, from the standpoint that you are just starting to see more of this? I mean, you didn't before. Let's say you've been doing cruises for, what, 20 years or so. 44. Uh, 44. Sorry. Sorry, old man. So 44 years. Yeah. <laughs> and at first, I'm sure you were universally loved. Uh, but <laughs> And then a little at a time, as we start to get more politically correct and words change and words are added to the dictionary and things are taken out of the dictionary as far as what is acceptable or what you can say about this or that. or, or I, I mean, I just learned a word yesterday that I've been using forever. I just happened to mention it. Somebody said, oh, that's, that's offensive now. It's like, what? I didn't know that. I said, yeah, for a long time. I just, anyhow, I am still learning those kinds of things. And I hear stories from time to time, even from from guys who are working on um, uh, school shows for, for colleges uh, and whatnot, they might say something because the, the college is kind of where some of these words start. And so once these words or phrases get going there and they, they take tr get traction, that the rest of the country starts getting in the social media and realize that maybe we shouldn't be using that kind of word or language or whatever. Anyhow, things have changed over the years. Boy, it's a long way of asking this question about, is that the way that you've seen it? Have, has it only been recently, and how recent has it been that you started to get the negative reaction like that? Well, fortunately, the, the, the positives have always outweighed the negative. But, but literally from the first time I ever worked on a cruise ship, which was July of 1978, there have always been comment forms. Now yeah. they're just more ubiquitous. And there's always been somebody who didn't like something. And, and, and unfortunately, the people who are positive, who like things, they, they, you and I are probably the type of people, if I go to a restaurant and have a great time and there's like a comment form, I'm probably not going to take the time to fill it out because I had a great time. Mm -hmm. Something really has to be bad for me to go on Google and rate something bad. But now I'm aware, maybe you need to rate everything good because maybe it's karma. But it, it's been from the beginning, but it is more it is more promoted to you now that, oh, it was a cruise director on Crystal Cruise Lines, Paul McFarlane, great cruise director. And he used to say, it's not the the 99 percent attaboys you get. It's the one percent. He called them snipers hmm. who want to who want to bring you down and, and don't and. And sometimes they'll go off for reasons that, like you said, the language changes all the time. Mm -hmm. So they get. I, how do you respond to that? And particularly for cruises, because I know how sensitive they are and they're thinking, OK, we got we can churn more people in. We can get somebody else. And if we've got a negative thing, we're going to go for someone who's got 100 percent positive. And but, but I know you've been working for a long time and they love you. And it, it's I think it sounds to me like they have overlooked some of those one or less than one percent that do those negative comments. I'm hoping they do. And I, I, I don't think, I don't care who he or she is. I don't think anybody's going to be 100% no negative. Somebody, I mean, the same people, the same two people that, that, that said they didn't like whatever in the tone of some of my act, they probably also didn't like the prime rib. They didn't like the cappuccino that was served them. Mm -hmm. Some people, some people look at the glasses as half empty or, instead of half full. Hey, if it's a wine glass, I'm thinking either way, there's still more wine. So mm -hmm. I'm a happy camper. Have you changed anything as a result of that? In other words, that after one or two ships in a row that they have specifically said something, did you decide, okay, I'm going to leave that out or I'm going to massage that? Or do you try things? I know like as a, as a lot of times we could do show after show and you get a chance to kind of tweak things, whether it's uh, your choreography or your blocking or whatever uh, within the context of your trick, but particularly you with the routine, which is what you say is most important there. Do you change that after you've heard some things and, or do you kind of keep that the same and say that was an anomaly? If, if, if I've only heard it one time, I'll change it. If I've heard it a couple of times, I think, well, uh, quoting Robert Bax, the golden rule is he with the goal rules. And, when Crystal Cruise Lines was paying my fee mm -hmm. and helped me pay for my home and my cars and the education, et cetera. And, and the, like three people on Crystal came and said, we don't like this. In fact, before I even made the change, Crystal came to me and they said, 
you can't use this puppet anymore on the wow. ship. And it was, it was the puppet that, that I just put down a lot. Mm -hmm. Was he was because some, some lady came and met with the hotel director and said that they thought I was quote, perpetuating a stereotype about, about young black men. And again, I've worked very hard with this character. He doesn't come out and do any kind of stereotypical jokes. He, he just happens to be a black guy who mm -hmm. works with, and we have, we, I mean, he'll, he'll make fun of me. Right. But, but you're not people, talking about his culture or anything. No, no, I'm not. I don't, mm -hmm. you know, I don't, I don't make jokes about, about anything like that. He just talks about what's going on in the world. You know, I mean, I'll, I, he'll, I'll comment if it's the month of February, I've done this joke a thousand times. I'll go, Alonzo, this is, this is February. This is black history month. And he looks at me, he says, yeah, right. They give us the shortest month in the whole year. I mean, you know, I, <laughs> I think that's funny. A, that's funny. I think it's a funny joke and it's not making fun of his race, his ethnicity. It's just a joke. Just an observation. <laughs> yeah. So, well, I would think comedians, though, also have a similar kind of an issue in which they wouldn't have figures, but they might have some lines or something they might say that is directed towards one race or culture or ethnic group or then and another. And um, even in an offhanded comment or politically, you know, that's another thing I would think, you know, that's a hot button of, of politics. If you're talking about one side or the other or liberal or conservative, you, I know the magic castle uh, has a requirement. I, I think it's even in the contract that you cannot introduce any humor or any comment whatsoever on any politics, because basically the reason is obviously there are people on both sides and they're hot buttons and you don't want to, uh, I mean, people are coming there for a good time. They're not coming there to enter into any kind of discussion uh, or controversy or anything. So do, do you try to eliminate that, let's say politics from and religion from your, uh, except for that preacher character, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Reverend Wonderful, uh, I I still do a couple of jokes about politics, but I'm I am absolutely fair and balanced. If I do two jokes about the Democratic side, I'll do two jokes about the Republican side, Good. and they're equally weighed, so no one can say mm -hmm. that I'm showing favoritism. But still, yeah. people and some people said, Mark, you need to eliminate eliminate those completely, but. I'm getting such big laughs at them from both sides. And people say, hey, thanks for being able to laugh at both sides. Thanks. Thank you for bringing out the humor in both sides of politics. I, you know, I, I try to steer away from anything that's completely divisive. I'm saying that and still I do a couple of political jokes, but I do them about both sides. I have a friend who is a writer for Lester Holt on the NBC Nightly News, and mm -hmm. I had talked with him one time and I said, it seems like that you are a little bit slanted, uh, a little bit more towards the liberal side. And he said, I'm glad that you said that because I, I love hearing comments of me being to one side or the other, because I get a lot of people come to me and say, oh man, you're way too conservative. So I feel like if I get comments on both sides, I'm pretty much down the middle. I mean, it, that makes sense. If you're trying to be balanced, that you have to show both sides otherwise you're lukewarm and you know you're spit out of your mouth you know and it's interesting that he would say that because sometimes i'll have people come up to me on the ship and they'll say i liked your show and then and then they'll kind of lean in and they can say but i can tell you're really either a liberal or a conservative i can tell tell me yeah. and, and i say you know the voting booth has a curtain on it and there's a reason because i'm not going to tell you there you and, go uh, but the fact that they think I'm, and I've heard it from both sides, I'm thinking, well, maybe I'm doing something right because they can't pinpoint my real feelings. I do one joke about that with my eagle puppet. When I, when, uh, I do a joke early in my routine, I talk about going to University of Georgia. Yes, go dogs, national champions, hopefully Monday night. I'm going to make a prediction. Yes, the dogs are going to beat Texas Christian University. Is that yeah. a bad thing to say to a Texan? But the, <laughs> But the joke I do is about having a degree in broadcast journalism from the Henry Grady School of Journalism. And I say, when I got my journalism degree, my professors at University of Georgia, they said, Mark Merchant, you write well and you write with imagination, but it's clear to us that you're not researching it. You're just making up the news. That's not journalism. Mm -hmm. And then I go, 
ladies and gentlemen, I was way ahead of my time. <laughs> <laughs> now that's a great I, line. <laughs> and then I say, today I could be an anchor for MSNBC or for Fox. I am bicoastal, ladies and gentlemen. I'm not a Democrat. I'm not a Republican. I am a registered libertarian. And I look at the puppet. I say, you know what a libertarian is? He nods his head. He goes, yes, it's a Republican who smokes weed, which gets a big <laughs> laugh. And I don't smoke weed or anything, yeah. but it's just, it's yeah. a joke. Yeah, I can see how some people will be taking that one way or the other. Because again, going back to what I said earlier, some people come in with a bias to begin with and looking for something. They they have a way of thinking. And so they're going to pick out certain things to validate their thought process, if that makes sense. You know? It it does. And they and and sometimes the direction they take it in. I, I'll give you two quick examples. In 1986. I had a, uh, a Ronald Reagan ventriloquist figure. It was mm -hmm. made by Steve Axtell, Axtell sure. Expressions. He made yeah. the magic drawing. He's made yep. a lot I've of- I've got things. one of his drawing boards. Yeah. <laughs> okay, of course, of course you do. It's the law. <laughs> and I had, I had the Ronald Reagan puppet. And on the ship in 1986, the band would play Hail to the Chief. Bum, bum, ba -dum, bum, bum. And I'd bring the puppet out and he would go, and I'm, I'm, I know I'm moving my lips now, but I don't have the puppet. I, he would go, well- and I'd say, Mr. President, do you know where we are? No, I, I haven't known where I've been for a long time. <laughs> and he had just he had just come back in real life. He had the real president, not yeah. the dummy. The yeah. real president had just come back from a uh, a summit in Reykjavik, Iceland with Mikhail Gorbachev. Mm -hmm. And I said, you were just at a summit with Mikhail Gorbachev. Did you get any important concessions out of Premier Gorbachev? And the Reagan puppet said, well, yes, I did. I, I got him to agree to get that cranberry sauce off his forehead. <laughs> <laughs> a great joke, a great laugh. A lady came up to me after the show, shaking. Wow. She said, I want to talk with young man, young man. I still get young man at 68. Thank you. Young man, I want to talk with you. That joke about Miguel Gorbachev was over the line. And I'm like, in what way? And she said, you made fun of his birthmark. I said, it's a joke and I'm not the first, nor will I be the last person to have made a joke about Mikhail Gorbachev's birthmark. He said, well, you don't know what it's like to have a disability and a disfiguring kind of thing. And I'm like, you, and she, she was talking about someone she knew and her family removed 14 times that had mm -hmm. a, a bad birthmark that, and I'm like, Ma'am, I'm, I'm not making fun of that person. Sure. I'm, I'm making a joke about Mikhail Gorbachev, who at that time, Ronald Reagan said he was the leader of, quote, the, the evil, evil empire. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> All right, second example. In uh, 2000, 2008, when uh, George W. was running for president mm -hmm. the first time. No, it wasn't George. It was uh, when it was when he was. It was 2008. He was president. It was John McCain was running. And you recall John McCain's vice presidential nominee? Uh, Sarah Palin. Sarah Palin. I was going to say a lady. I can't remember Palin. her name. Yeah. And I did a joke. And we were in Alaska. So everybody was talking about Sarah sure, Palin. Because of course. she was the governor. Had yeah. been the governor. And I think she was still the governor. And I said uh, to my puppet, I said to my lady puppet, Zelda Rose, I said, Sarah Palin, her life has changed in a big way from being governor of Alaska. Now she, her husband, and all of her children are all being guarded by the Secret Service. And then Zelda said, really? I didn't think she believed in protection. <laughs> <laughs> and some, and that's a great joke. You're laughing yeah. at it. Thank mm -hmm. you. Yeah. A Fun. lady came up to me and said, tell me about the Sarah Palin joke. And I said, it's a joke. And she said, well, what does it mean? I said, it's a joke, ma'am. And she said, you said it because Sarah Palin refused to terminate a pregnancy when she was having a Down syndrome child. And I said, ma'am, whoa, time out. Mm -hmm. that, that, that is way off base. I'm not anywhere. She said, don't tell me what to think. I said, ma'am, I promise you that didn't enter my brain pan. And mm -hmm. I said, I'm sorry you feel that way, but and I've met Sarah Palin and her parents and her were on a cruise that I did. 
and I still do a joke with Sarah Palin as a punchline with my eagle puppet. Mm -hmm. He was in the Raptor Rehabilitation Center. Okay. Because, because he was injured in a hunting accident. And I say, really, someone fired upon you? And the eagle says, yes, accidentally. I said, who fired upon you? He said, Sarah Palin. I said, really? He said, yeah, but I'm lucky. She leaned so far to the right, she could only hit my left wing. <laughs> <laughs> and Sarah Palin and her mom and dad, when I'm shaking hands, and I didn't know they were on the ship. Yeah. They came up to me and I'm like, holy cow, Sarah Palin. And she said, hi, Mark. Great show. You betcha. And I said, well, you were, you were part of a punchline. She said, I know. And I loved it. She said, it's funny. Thank you for making us laugh. So That's great. politics aside, Miss Palin has my respect because she can laugh at herself. And that may be the bottom line of our society today in general is we are learning not to laugh at ourselves uh, and taking everything a lot too seriously. Yep. And I, I've said that in my show a million times. If you can't laugh at yourself, you've never You're stood naked not... in a full length mirror. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I remember uh, um, uh, another comedian of saying, well, if you can't laugh at yourself, you're just not funny. Um, <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> yeah. Um, so do you find then also, as we start to kind of wrap up over here, uh, I know you work some conventions, but also some cruise ships. Have you found that in some cases there are some companies or cruise ships or magic conventions or juggler or event conventions or whatever who might, or even the magic castle or wherever of saying, we can't book you or we won't, unless you cut this or that, or don't do that. So are you given some restrictions or do you feel like that sometimes there are things you could do, but you are not because of people feeling as if there might be somebody taking offense? Uh, both. I, I have, I have been told by some conventions, I'm not to venture into, to this area. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, and I know they're hiring me. And, and if I want the job, I'm going to agree to that. And because I'm a man of integrity, I'm going to honor it. Mm -hmm. I've had some other conventions, for example, Abbott's, that I've worked at Abbott's three times and always done very well. Mm -hmm. Well, I know Abbott's is not going to use me again mm -hmm. because the booker, uh, Mike Miller, who's never yeah. met me, but he told me, he said, I can't use you because you had one complaint at the convention in 2015, <coughs> excuse me, Scott. And I said, one complaint, what was it about? And they said, oh, it had something to do with a political joke. And I said, well, how about if I take out any politics? And they said, no, <coughs> we- One strike and you're out. <laughs> yeah, which, you know, it's, I feel like Jim Morrison when he worked, when he was with The Doors, well, he uh, was The Doors. He was. And worked at the Ed Sullivan Theater, the Ed Sullivan Show. And when he sang Light My Fire, they told him you have to change the lyrics. You can't say, girl, we couldn't get much higher. Mm -hmm. And he said, look, he, he went ahead and sang it. And then the booker came back in the dressing room and said, you promise you wouldn't do that. You're never going to work the Sullivan show again. And Jim Morrison said, hey, I just did the Sullivan show. So, you know, I, if people are listening, I'd love to work habits again. And Greg Bordner, you know that I'll do a good job. And regardless of what George Schindler says, I'm a good guy. <laughs> so please, <laughs> please, let me come back to Colon, Michigan. Colon, Michigan is right next to Bladder, Michigan. Thank you very much. <laughs> it's down that lower, lower area. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yes. That's yes. Right. Well, there are so many different conventions. Certainly you can work in uh, as you get older and start to, are you thinking about retirement or uh, doing no, less work? No. Or do you just kind of see yourself doing this for another 20 years I, at this I same see, pace? I see, I'm going to do it until, until I can't do it. I, I love performing. I, yeah. I, probably like you, performing is, is, almost, is almost an addiction and a drug to me. Mm -hmm. Everything about what I do is fun, even the things that aren't fun. The last cruise ship that I got on, I flew to St. Martin. The airport was chaotic. When I got to St. Martin, that was fine. When I went to get on the ship the next day in St. Martin, just due to oh, just, just things happened. It was the holiday. The port didn't know I was supposed to be there, and the ship didn't even know I was supposed to be oh, there. Wow. 
And it's not fun to stand in the hot sun, especially when you're as white as me or as Alonzo says, you're not white, you're translucent. But when, you, <laughs> when you're as pale as me, but I did get on the ship. And then when I got there, they had the wrong, and, and I'm, I'm a low maintenance performer, Scott, but the one thing that's in my contract, I have to have a room that has a window or a, mm -hmm. it has to have some natural light. I won't go to an inside cabin. Mm -hmm. And they went to put me in an inside cabin. And I said, this is not in my contract. But then I did my show the next night and thank you, God, it rocked. I had great fun. And I'm like, this, this is fun. I always tell people that I do the shows for free. It's getting there and carrying the suitcases for which I get paid. That's kind of what I've heard um, Sean Farquhar said about cruise ships uh, that, that where he gets paid for are all of the uh, travel he does on planes getting to and from the ships. <laughs> He's a great performer. He's he's Canadian gentleman, right? Correct. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I've I've never been on a ship with him, but I've seen some of his his work and I have have a lot of respect for Sean. Yep. As do I. Great guy. And on so many different levels. Well, listen, I appreciate our time together. This has been great. And also with Alonzo, thank him very much. And, uh, and everybody then as well. It's all part of your your group. When I do a school show. Because magic still works at a school show. I always yeah. open the school show. I talk about ventriloquism and how when I first started, I didn't have a puppet. I was able to throw my voice. Like, for instance, in this Coke bottle here, I take the top off. And if you listen real close, kids, there's a man who lives in the bottle. How you doing? You all right? You're in the bottle? Yeah. What's it like in a bottle of Coca-Cola? A lot of gas. A lot of gas. Yeah, yeah. So I put the top on. <laughs> <laughs> Don't burp in front of Scott. Sorry, I didn't know it's his turn. It's not his turn. Yeah, I'll put the top on. No. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, little magic taught to me by the Maharasha and his wife, the mouth of Washa. Cover the bottle. A silk handkerchief right from Rice Studios. On the count of three, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, I'm going to make the Coke bottle disappear. One, two, three, as you can see. You can't do it. I'm still here. You can't. I can tell by your applause. It's deafening. <laughs> Very good. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. That was silent applause. Yes. I, I, well, I call that Zen applause. The sound of one hand clapping. So. <laughs> <laughs> yes thank you david Ginn, for that i love that effect <laughs> i've used that for years as well david That's Ginn, great. thank you david Ginn, for for being my friend for since 1968 mm -hmm. you know he he's he's a solid guy booked me a lot of school shows and the school show that i did in may of 1986 i met a second grade school teacher named cindy osborne i asked her on stage for the audience participation bit I fell in love, Scott, and two years later, I got married. We got married, she and I, on stage at the Winter Carnival of Magic in 1988. I was there. I remember that. You were there. Yes. And then we, we sat down and watched Jody Barron do the illusion show. Right. Jody Barron did and the show. Yeah. We, we went in the dealer's room, and one dealer, I'm not making this up, one dealer said, that was so cool you getting married on stage. I want to give you a wedding present. He was a dealer who sold feather flowers. Guess what present he gave me? A botania. The wilting flower. Oh, the wilting. <laughs> <laughs> like, Another David Ginn thing. Yeah, perfect. I'm only, I'm only 33. <clears throat> flower. Was that the year, by the way, they had the blizzard and we had to have the show over for another year? It was in Pigeon Forge. Was that the same year as that? No, it was in, it was in Gatlinburg. It was right. 1988. Yeah, well, that was in Gatlinburg when we had the that, but I think it might have been in the 90s. Now, think about that. That might have been around 92 or 3, now that I'm thinking about that. So that might have been a little bit later. But I do remember back in 88, I had gone to a few of those then as well. Well, as I said, as far as the, the uh, podcast, again, I appreciate that. And one last thing, and that is to ask you your magic word or your phrase, because my word, my podcast is called The Magic Word Podcast. And so I would like to know, what is it that is your philosophy of life? I'm not looking for a word. I'm looking for something that, that means a lot to you. What? Why do you wake up in the morning? You see that my DVD, it says, I'm happy. That is my philosophy. Mm -hmm. Goldfinger, the magician, Jack Goldfinger Jack, and mm -hmm. Dove, mm -hmm. when I was at Robert Back's wedding in 2000, 
10, Goldfinger was always like, how you doing? And I used to say, any day above ground is a great day. And he said, ah, ah, Mark, what you need to say is I'm happy. And I have been saying that now, Scott, since 2010. You ask me anytime, how you doing? I don't say I'm okay. I don't say I'm fine. I say I'm happy because I am. I'm, I'm blessed. I'm getting to do what the minister at Mount Carmel Christian Church told me. Don't work for a living, Mark. Do something you love to do so much that you'll do it for free, but do it so well that you get paid. I'm married to the most wonderful woman in the world who happens to be sitting across the room from me now and is, and is pointing a gun at me unless I say this. Now, so this may be your last, <laughs> your last uh, podcast. <laughs> I, hey, I don't know, but I know I'm, I'm, I'm not going to retire. I, as long as God blesses me with the ability to do this and people keep hiring me and, and I keep growing as a performer, I love what I do. Why not? Well, Mark, thank you very much. I appreciate your time. Appreciate your words of wisdom and everything. We've had uh, just great conversation. So I thank you very much and wish you great, more great success into the future as well. Glad you're my friend. And look forward to seeing you next time. Glad you're my friend. Thank you, Scott. <laughs> Keep on keeping on. Thanks a lot. So with the Magic Board Podcast, that was Mark Merchant. This is Scotty Al. 